I think I have to also echo what the fellow panelists have said in congratulating you in launching this very important institution. And I'm sure there is a lot of room for such, uh, you know, institutions in a democracy of ours, especially when you see all the signs that indicate that we need to be more vigilant. I also think that it is very important for me to speak at this time. I had always complained when people wanted us to talk and reflect on the 20 years of democracy. I said, but there are elections and people are so emotional and it's that silly season. They can't reason well until after elections, then you can <laughs> take an honest stock because at that time they are not sure whether it's a campaign platform and so forth. I do think that South Africa's transition to democracy is one of the most complex. But we have failed to have a sustained, robust discourse to reflect some aspects of this transition. And as a result, we do not have tools of analysis adequate enough to apprehend what has happened and what has been evolving over time. That is why having institutions like Democracy Works in the space of knowledge production, in the space of opinion making and research is very important. South Africa's democracy is at the crossroads as we speak. And one of the things that have inhibited us from reflecting incisively on the phenomenon of South African transition is precisely what my colleague uh, and fellow panelist, uh, uh, Mr. Mbegi, has just said. The notion of South African exceptionalism was used effectively prior to 1994 by the white regime to say we are geographically in Africa, but we do not belong here in many respects. And it has since been refurbished and extended beyond 1994 to say, yes, we are not like them. Certain things won't happen to us. And because we lacked those tools to understand and do comparative analysis, we find ourselves repeating some of the issues. But broadly, if we reflect on the South Africa, the state of democracy in South Africa, I would say the institutions of democracy, the architecture of democracy is in place. Only that those institutions vary in degrees of success. And the second aspect is that in as far as the welfare dimension of the state, your social security, the state has done fairly well. But in the productive sector, that is where I think the failure has been. As a result today, you still have unemployment, poverty, inequality, and growing corruption. The one problem, though, that we may make in trying to understand this phenomenon and this democracy, we have become sometimes fixated with what is happening in the state per se, to a point where what is happening in the private sector and how the two are interpenetrating gets left outside. Even when we talk corruption, in terms of the mutually corrupting relationship between these two entities, that tend to escape the gaze. One of the reasons is that we have not adequately understood the power structure and the fact that it doesn't reside just in the political, it resides in the social, it resides in the economic, and how those influence policy making. 
and how those influence the agenda setting in the country. But quickly, I also want to raise the issue of the identity, whether it's racial or ethnic. We tend to be very sensitive in dealing with that particular matter, understanding the history that we had. It would be a miracle to say what dominated 350 years has suddenly vanished in two decades. And precisely because we have a dual consciousness about issues that we think are sensitive in South Africa. Therefore, we suffer from this acute honesty deficit, such that between eight and five, we have one set of truth about things we think are sensitive. When we get home, we have a different set of truth. And that in itself, I think, is proving to be quite a challenge. And very quickly, the one other thing that I have noticed is that the failure of economy to perform has created pressure on people to go through politics as a career, not as a calling. And as a result, right now they are using the incumbency to access resources and they find the private sector equally willing to embrace the opportunity and become the major client of the state. There you have this mutually corrupting relationship and more so when almost in every sector you have these monopoly <laughs> companies. Whether you talk telecommunication or you talk mining, you talk this, you do have three, four dominant players, which makes the emergence of your small players into the space and also into the space of influence very much constrained. And one last issue I wanted to say is that uh, two points. We've tended to also be obsessed with political parties as agents of democracy. Now that internal democracy within the political parties is beginning to erode and they are faltering, we are left with very little space. Hence the issue of a civil society and social movement become very important. And also because the trade unions tend to be very much attached to the political parties. You would struggle to understand them in a sense of a civil society per se, in an autonomous sense. And lastly, for those who have been fascinated by the alternatives to the mainstream politics ideologically to the left, I do think that an honest reflection is needed that since the collapse of the Eastern Bloc, theoretically, intellectually, ideologically, there's not been serious work to reconceptualize the left as an alternative. Hence, even during the crisis, the financial crisis, uh, in the Western system. There were no obvious alternatives. And that is what in South Africa we're experiencing when you look at the SACP, the unions, and so forth. So I do think that that in itself is something worth reflecting on. Thank you.